from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Library of Congress and to the inauguration ceremony for our fourth National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Let's applaud the event itself as we get started. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Library of Congress's Center for the Book, the Reading and Literacy Promotion Arm, and we are a co-sponsor of this wonderful project. Uh, our center was established by law as a public-private partnership way back in 1977. Um, and our mission is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy. The center also administers the library's Poetry and Literature Center and the Young Readers Center, which you're going to hear more about and we hope have a chance to see before the morning is over. So thank you to everyone who is here today. We are especially privileged to have two members of Congress, and I want to also expend, extend a special way, welcome to the Stuart Hobson Middle School students who are somewhere around here. Can I hear from them? And welcome also to, this is the Library of Congress's Jefferson Building. Jefferson is our inspiration, and we're here in the spirit of learning and reading and literacy, which he embodies. Because Congressman Debbie Wasserman Schultz has a conflicting engagement, we will hear from her before she needs to leave. Congresswoman Schultz, Wasserman Schultz, is a special friend of the library and of the Young Readers Center. She played a key role in making the Young Reader Center a reality at the Library of Congress. And as some of you know, in October 2009, we opened the center, and Congressman Wasserman Schultz and her children joined Congressman Adderholt and his son, he was also here today, for the ribbon cutting ceremony. We're so pleased to have both of them here. Let's give them a round of applause. Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz is the ranking member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on the Legislative Branch and also a member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations. Let's welcome her one more time, Congresswoman <laughs> Schultz. Thank you so much, John, and I appreciate that kind introduction and for being a true visionary for the Library of Congress, and it is really wonderful. Great to see all the kids. It makes me miss my kids, but I'm going home today, so looking forward to that in a few hours, and I'm really pleased to be here today at the inauguration of Kate DiCamillo as the next National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, a great source of pride for her family. I know she's excited as well, and choosing Kate DiCamillo as the newest National Ambassador was probably one of the easier decisions for Dr. Billington. There are a lot of challenges that the library faces, especially during uh, you know, difficult uh, sequester-based funding times, but this was not one of those challenges. Kate is an award-winning writer of children's books. Her stories speak to children of all ages and backgrounds by exploring complex themes such as loss, parental absence, and spirituality in a way that younger people can so easily relate. Not only is she an amazing author, she's also a Florida Gator. Go Gators! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it's so exciting to see a fellow alumna at the University of Florida be selected for this important role, and it's fitting. See, the Gator Nation is everywhere, my friends. <laughs> and it's fitting that we have chosen the very building that houses the Library of Congress Young Readers Center as the location for today's ceremony. It was just over a year ago, four years ago, that I was here with my colleague, Congressman Adderholt, for the grand opening of the Young Readers Center with my three children, Jake, Rebecca, and Shelby. And that was a very special day for all of us. It's incredible to see how much progress has been made over the last four years, thanks to Dr. Billington's continued leadership. And I just wanna share with you the story of how I came to have a conversation with Dr. Billington about 
needing to make sure that the jewel of the Library of Congress, the Jefferson Building, had a place to instill passion about reading and books in young people. When I was elected to Congress in 2004, my children had just turned five years old. And so you can imagine that story reading and books were really something that was a big part of their lives and, and still are. And so the very first thing that my children, and I have twins, my, my, uh, my older two are twins, that Jake and Rebecca wanted to do when we came to Washington, Mom, I want to go across the street to the Library of Congress and check out a book. <laughs> OK, no problem. We're going to go do that. So we marched across the street together and uh, got to the Library of Congress, went into the, uh, went into the main room, and went up to the desk and said, where is the children's section? And sadly, at the time, the children's section was in McLean. That was, the, that was the response we got because all of the children's books were housed in another building for very sensible reasons. But when I had a chance a couple of years later to, uh, to meet with Dr. Billington the first time after I became uh, the chair of the Legislative Branch Appropriations Subcommittee, that's really the first thing I told him. And I told him that story and said, you know, if there's any place in Washington, D.C., that we have an opportunity to inspire children's passion and love of reading, it's the Library of Congress in the main building. And, you know, folks like Dr. Billington and high profile people, often when confronted with, uh, you know, with, with something that may be slightly uncomfortable, will say, oh, well, I'll look into it. No, not, not, uh, not James Billington. He immediately said, oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. We are going to take care of that and take care of it, he did. The Young Readers Center was, uh, was opened and now it has expanded in size and amount of programming since the opening, welcoming an average of 40,000 visitors annually. And the center now includes titles in Braille and foreign languages and this year they introduced an author series on books and beyond for young people, expanding literacy programs for schools in the DC metropolitan region and continuing the very popular story time each Friday morning, which Robert and I had an opportunity to have our kids uh, attend as well. I'm, I'm so excited about our mission at the Young Reader Center because right here at the greatest library on earth, we're instilling a love of reading in children. And we know the evidence speaks for itself. In those critical first few years and beyond, reading to a child is make or break for language acquisition and being prepared for that first day of school. And a child who reads is a child who is setting themselves up for academic success at every level. Each time I've sat down with a book with my twins, Rebecca and Jake, or my youngest, Shelby, I relish the quality time that we spend together and the bonding moments that happen as we share in those stories. More than just a learning skill, I know that as they become readers, they are having the chance to experience the world beyond themselves. Through reading, they have a chance to discover new places and travel back in time through history. They are learning empathy, compassion, and what it feels like to be in someone else's shoes. That's why the work that you all do here at the Library of Congress is so important, and thanks for all you do. And I can, I can report that, especially for my daughter, Rebecca, who has a lifelong 14 year, since she's four, they're 14, love of books. I, 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 I think I'm single-handedly keeping Barnes & Noble in business. <laughs> Every weekend, practically, when I come, come home, Mom, I, I'm done with all the books that we bought. It's, it's time to go uh, to the store again. And now we actually, a couple of weeks ago, she said, because li the libra public library, thankfully, is across the street from, uh, from the high school. And she said, Mom, we've got to go renew my library card, because uh, Lord knows where that was when uh, <laughs> the last time we used it, because I want to start checking out some books, too. So. Dr. Billington, thank you so much for, uh, for your commitment. Thank you to the staff here at the Library of Congress, a, a dedicated group of public servants like this I've never seen. This is an incomparable, incomparable institution, and I am so par proud to be the, the chair of the committee that, uh, that makes sure that you have the resources that you need, and you can always count on me, and I'm sure continue to count on uh, Congressman Adderholt, who, when he was my ranking member, was an absolute pleasure to work with. Just so you know, everything is not entirely broken in Washington. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz. That was wonderful. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the Librarian of the Congress, James H. Billington. You've heard a little bit about him already. 
Uh, Dr. Billington is the 13th person to hold this title. The President of the United States actually appoints the Librarian of Congress. Uh, Dr. Billington has been our librarian since 1987 when he was nominated by President Reagan and unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. He has been instrumental in bringing the Library of Congress into the modern age, especially with not only the Young Reader Center, the National Digital Library Program, and the World Digital Library Initiative. Although he is a great promoter of exploiting the wonders of technology and in sharing our resources with the entire world, he is a scholar, a person of books, and a tireless supporter of books and reading. And that's why he was so immediately supportive of the suggestion of the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature Program and the development of the Young Reader Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Librarian of Congress, James H. Billington, Dr. Billington. Thank you very much, John, and welcome to all of you. It's great to have you here um, at the library. And I uh, want to personally thank, of course, um, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who's had to leave, but uh, she really uh, was extraordinary in helping uh, bring the message and the idea of of a Young People's Reading Center within this beautiful Jefferson building. Um, and of course, I have to personally thank also Congressman Robert Adderholt for his enthusiastic and indeed continuing support for the Library of Congress caucus uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Congress, which is something new in the 213 year history of Congress additionally, so, um, uh, and I might mention that uh, as, uh, as co-chair of this caucus, um, Congressman Adderall has actively worked to raise awareness among his congressional colleagues of the collections, exhibits, and activities of the library, as has, of course, uh, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, so that's a, they're a great team, and we want to we're very grateful that uh, she could be with us and that Congressman Adderholt uh, continues in this new role of a, of a caucus of support for what we do here. Let me also uh, acknowledge and thank Robin Adelson, Executive Director of the Children's Book Council, the co-sponsor of this um, remarkable uh, ambassador program. Uh, with an organization that's dedicated to instilling a love of reading in young people. It's a natural and a very welcome uh, uh, collaborator and co-sponsor co of this whole entire enterprise. Today we highlight the importance of literacy, education, development, and betterment of the lives of young people through the appointment of our new National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. <clears throat> now in the audience we have two previous ambassadors, John Seska, um, the originator of this, and Walter Dean Myers, is Walter? Well, there we, oh good, <laughs> okay, well you can't have two, um, two launchings of this program that have been more successful that involve people who were already wonderful ambassadors because they're both deep believers uh, in the absolute fundamental importance of reading for everything else on the learning spectrum. By the way, it's great to have your old kids here. I'll talk, about you, <laughs> talk to you later. I don't want to think this is just some mutual admiration society. Among, <laughs> but uh, they've been wonderful and we have a uh, um, uh, John, of course, inaugurated the position as our first ambassador in 2008 and filled his role with characteristic enthusiasm and wit. And our most recent ambassador, Walter Dean Myers, uh, brought his message of reading is not optional. A wonderful way of putting it to young people in schools, libraries, and uh, even uh, detention centers around the country. 
and Walter and John, you guys really have been marvelous ambassadors, and I, I think we ought to give them a round of applause for making this thing really nice. You know, we had this question, I wonder was question, should this be a laureate or an ambassador and so on? Well, I think uh, the ambassador thing is uh, appropriate. The laureate, poet laureate was created by the Congress. That's a statutory um, item. And I, uh, we, we wanted to get this thing going and also suggest the idea that the ambassadorship idea, and I have to say, it was I was a little skeptical myself, but uh, John, John Cole persuaded me that, that this is good. And the more I think about it, and the more I see what they've done, they really have been ambassadors, and it's wonderful. And it's a kind of laureateship, too, but, uh, but this ambassador title is an appropriate one. And young people are the most important people to send an embassy to it. And our new ambassador for young people's literature, Kate uh, DiCamilla, um, is simply one of America's finest writers of young people's literature. She brings a message of hopefulness and relief amid seemingly impossible circumstances. And that allows her to connect with young people on a personal level and puts her in a unique position to call attention to the importance of literacy in our nation. So we want to welcome you. We want to thank you, Kate, for accepting this position and for the outstanding work that you've done in your prolific writing career um, and for what you, I know you will do for our nation over the next two years. So we really do thank you for doing this, and we welcome you to this and look forward to your ambassadorship. So thank you all for being here to celebrate this wonderful ambassadorship to the young. And I think we should have an introductory round of applause for the new. <laughs> Yeah, sort of speaking from the other end of the age of defining way, insofar as that defines our identities, um, uh, you're, you look as if you could be part of the young people you should be the ambassador <laughs> to. <clears throat> so thank you for doing this. Now let me now turn things over to this interesting program, to the Library of Congress's champion of reading, John Cole. You've already He's already been up here and he will now, uh, he was the founder and long time still continuing head of the library's center for the book. He has been a great uh, promoter of this ambassadorship from the very beginning as I've already sort of indicated. He is himself a kind of master ambassador with 50 regional consulates. <laughs> These are the local affiliates of the library's center for the book that are present in every state of the United States. He recently managed the first year also of a totally new Library of Congress program to award three prizes and codify best practices for overcoming illiteracy, both at home and abroad. <clears throat> we are interested, the library is interested in, and John has been a major architect, of our whole emphasis on lifelong learning, which begins with literacy, which is the entry point to everything else, <clears throat> and this climaxes for a, a Nobel level prize at the very other end for lifelong dedication to the study of humanity. <clears throat> Pardon my frog here, just interfering, but let me say that um, John is as modest as he is dedicated to books and reading, and reading everywhere and at all ages. This has been his dedication and his fine staff in the Center for the Book and in many around the country uh, with whom he's contacted and is, is evangelizing. 
So please welcome our master of ceremonies today and a major uh, master ambassador himself, John Cole. Thank you, Dr. Billington. I'm now going to introduce my partner in crime for this particular project, uh, Robin Adelson, whom uh, Dr. Billington mentioned. Uh, Rob Robin has, excuse me, I'm, Dr. Billington got my, got, made me lose my place here. Um, but Robin is gonna give you a little bit of background about uh, the project and the selection process. Uh, Robin is the executive director of Every Child a Reader and of the Children's Book Council, and, and also a longtime friend and partner of the Center for the Books National Reading Promotion Partnership. Uh, the Children's Book Council was established in 1945. It's another example of the partnerships that exist now that we're trying to emphasize and bring back to do more for books and reading and literacy. Since 1945, it's been the nonprofit trade association uh, for trade books of children and young adults in the United States. The CBC promotes the use and enjoyment of trade books for young people, most prominently as the official sponsor of the Children's Book Week, the longest running literacy event in the country. So we're proud to be worth a, a partner with the Children's Book Council. Robin, could you step forward? Thank you, John. Hi, everybody. This is our fourth launch of National Ambassadors for Young People's Literature, and I have to say they, they never stop being exciting, and they never stop being inspiring and motivating, and we are so delighted to see familiar faces in this room, new faces, absolutely. Um, familiar faces too. This is a post that starts with a wonderful and brilliant selection committee. Every two years we bring in a new selection committee and we have among us today some of our selection committee veterans. Um, Maria Salvador from the very first selection committee and Jenny Brown from the two ambassadors, well immediate past ambassador selection committee um, and our prior ambassadors who also serve on selection, the selection committee for the incoming ambassadors, John Sheska, Walter Dean Myers, um, and unfortunately, Catherine could not be with us today. Um, she sends her love and affection to everybody, particularly to her friend Kate. Um, and Catherine also, Catherine served on the selection committee that selected Walter. The selection committee is always told that we are looking for somebody with a wide body of work that is appealing to children, motivating to children, readable by children, um, and exciting. Good books, great books, but also written by personalities that go so beyond the books that they write. John, Walter, and Kate, and Catherine as well, certainly, are people that know how to reach everybody in a room. They, they reach the kids in the room, and they reach the kids within all of us, and we are so honored to be a part of this program and to give these amazing people a forum so that they could do their work, they could do their magic and reach everybody. Um, absolutely, literacy is the foundation of everything and learning how to read just isn't enough. Loving to read is what gets you to the next step and these are people that encourage you to love to read because the minute you meet them or hear them or read their words, you can't help but fall in love with reading. So again, we are so delighted to be a part of this program that brings important superstars directly to kids. They reach you, they speak to you. In our world, we think they're your superheroes. We are grateful in addition to these fabulous people and of course especially to these fabulous people um, for the financial support that we receive to run this program. So in that vein, we are most grateful to Penguin Young Readers Group, Scholastic Inc., Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, HarperCollins, Random House, Candlewick, Lois Lenski Covey Foundation, and the JPPB Foundation for making this program possible. 
Beyond financial support, there's so much that has to be done for this program. And to that end, we are so grateful to our partners in the Library of Congress. Um, the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress is one of the most tireless groups of, of people and vision and passion, and we could not have ever asked for a better partner. So thank you. We are so grateful to our publicist, Virginia and Agnos from Goodman Media, who has been with us since the very beginning of this program, because as you all know, you can have a great idea, but if the idea doesn't get out there and nobody's ever heard of it, it kind of doesn't matter. So thank you for Virginia, to Virginia for allowing us and helping us make sure people know about the great work that these people are doing as ambassadors. Thank you, of course, to the tireless staff of Every Child a Reader and the Children's Book Council. And thank you again, and this is getting back to the very fun part of this, thank you again to our ambassadors. Um, each of our ambassadors has made this program their own. They've taken the initial vision of the program and they've really infused themselves into it, um, which was what we always had hoped would happen. And to see it happening with new ambassadors every two years is so exciting. Each of our ambassadors has developed a platform and for two years they go across the country and visit with children and teachers and librarians and parents and caregivers and they deliver their message always coming back to whatever platform it is that they are passionate about and that they are focusing their term on. For each of our ambassadors in connection with their platform Every Child a Reader and the Children's Book Council has given a gift to the ambassador to help them on their way. We do this because our ambassadors are superheroes. And superheroes, as much as they have superpowers, sometimes need a little help. John Sheska's platform was reaching reluctant readers. To John, we gave a cape. Because if Superman can have a cape, John Sheska can have a cape. He still wanted a helicopter and a jetpack. <laughs> he got a cape. <laughs> Catherine Patterson's platform was Read for Your Life. And in order to sprinkle magic on children across the country and encourage them to read for your life, we thought it would be helpful to give her a magic wand. And everybody knows that Catherine Patterson is a wizard with a magic wand. Walter Dean Myers chose reading is not optional as his platform. Walter had a really strong message to deliver over the last two years. Walter is no doubt going to continue far into the future de developing and delivering this message. Walter needed some extra little weaponry to help him. Walter received a sword. So here we have Kate. <laughs> Kate's platform, which you will hear about from Kate herself soon, is Stories Connect Us. And Kate is all about communities, commun stories developing communities, stories bringing communities together, stories bringing each of us together and creating communities. Because you know what? We're so much stronger as a community than any of us are alone. And so, if you're following my train of thought here, you might have guessed this a little bit. It's not food. <laughs> But every community you visit will no doubt give you food. <laughs> but in the spirit of community, some superheroes have a sidekick. Kate, however, gets a community of sidekicks. Some of them might make you think of her books. I'm not going to say whether that was deliberate or not. But Kate's community of sidekicks include a rabbit, A magic elephant. And the one that we know already has superpowers, a squirrel. It is a squirrel cape. <laughs> if you have any doubt, it's a squirrel with superpowers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you've got to read Flora and Ulysses. Kate. We adore you already. We are so excited about the next two years. Nothing you say can scare us off. She keeps trying. It's not going to work. We wish you all the best. We are here for you. 
and to Walter and to John, we are always here for you as you continue to, to inspire children and grown-ups and all of us, um, those of us who aren't sure if we're children or grown-ups or somewhere in between. Continue, as you continue to inspire all of us forever, we are here to help you in any way you need, and we love this job. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much, every way, Robin. Uh, you've already heard about the important role that uh, Representative Robert Adderholt has played uh, in the creation of the Young Reader Center. I'd like to call on him for a few remarks. As a reminder, Congressman Adderholt is the chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Agriculture, and he also serves on the Appropriations Subcommittees on Homeland Security and Commerce. Please welcome Congressman Robert Adderholt. Thank you, John. It's a real honor for me to be here as well. Um, it's uh, with my uh, colleague, who I know had to leave out a little earlier, uh, Debbie Waltzman Schultz. And uh, as, as she mentioned, we both had the pleasure of being here back in 2009 uh, when the uh, uh, center was opened. And uh, it was a uh, real treat for me to be here uh, also with my son. Uh, my daughter, unfortunately, wasn't able to make it for the day. But my son, uh, at the time, was five years old. He's nine now. And uh, my son, Robert Hayes, was uh, able to be here for that opening. So uh, it is uh, good to be back uh, about four years later and to be here uh, for this occasion. Uh, I'd like to particularly welcome uh, the uh, new ambassador uh, for uh, the uh, young people's literature, Kate DiCamillo, uh, and also the former ambassadors that are here. Thank you for your uh, time here and for uh, taking time to, uh, to join us. And um, last but not least, of course, the students from the Stuart Hobson Middle School. It is great to have you here today and uh, a real a pleasure to welcome you to, to Capitol Hill and to uh, the Library of Congress. Uh, I think everyone in this room, and you wouldn't be here if you didn't, knows that uh, reading uh, is so important. And uh, the reading to children and teaching the read to read is uh, something that uh, really stays with uh, someone through their adulthood. Uh, we all have memories of the books that we've read as children, and uh, these books really become a part of the narrative of our, our lives in the future. I'm sure most of you remember books that opened uh, your eyes to new and different things as a child, uh, those that um, help you see new things in a new light. And, uh, of course, uh, I'm, I wonder how many of you wanted to rediscover the books of your childhood when you had children and uh, share them with the next generation. Uh, it's no uh, secret that studies have shown that reading helps expand a child's vocabulary and stimulates the language development. But what we know just from experience is that reading teaches children about the world beyond their front door uh, and expands their creativity and it can help them develop empathy with others and it is a wonderful electronic form of entertainment, unless you have an e-reader, of course, and uh, we make an exception for that. Uh, when I first came to Congress, I remember one of my colleagues, and some of you may not know this, but from time to time, as members of Congress, we actually go to schools and we read to school children. And one of our uh, favorite books that uh, to read to school children uh, is uh, a book about uh, a government uh, of uh, mice that uh, have created a government which is just like the Congress of the United States and in their world they have a, a house and Senate just like we do and we it's really sort of geared for the second graders and uh, we go into schools from time to time and read that book and it's a real uh, treat to get to do that one of my colleagues reminded me uh, and I think it stands true of it even today that uh, you know it's always important to tell young people, no matter if they're in the second grade or whether they're seniors in high school, that if you want to be uh, a leader, you need to be a reader. And uh, I think that's something that we all need to keep in mind. This position of National Ambassador for Young People's uh, Literature was, uh, of course, created to rise awareness of the importance of young people's literature as it relates to lifelong literacy, education, and development of the betterment of the lives of young people. So we look forward to hearing uh, more about the work of Ms. DiCamillo over the next two years. Uh, her books have left a lasting impression on young people 
And I believe her efforts to appeal to generations to read together sends a wonderful message to families and to communities around the world. So again, it's a real honor for me to be here today to join you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Billington, again for the invitation to be here. I appreciate those uh, dedicated and talented writers uh, and all their involvements to try to get young people more involved in the reading process. So again, God bless you. Uh, God bless your efforts here, and we look forward to working with you very much in the future. Thank you. We're a young program, but we have a few traditions that have just really been developed. You can tell from talking to Robin, she's got a sense of history and a sense of how we move ahead each year as we look going far ahead, we hope. One of them is to have a final word from the current National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Walter Dean Myers is here, and I would like you to just say a few words about your ambassadorship. Let's give him a hand. It's over? I'm finished? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> when, I, when I became national ambassador um, two years ago, I was more or less prepared for the, the travel. Lots of travel, lots of flying, lots of airports. And oh my goodness. It, it, it got to the point where in, in some airports, I could walk up to the newsstand and the woman would say, peanuts again? <laughs> that was fine. And, and I knew it was going to take my time. And so I was more or less prepared for that. What I was not prepared for, and oh no, I was also prepared for someone saying to me, oh, Walter D. Myers, you're my favorite author. No, I said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. But what I was not prepared for, and what I'm telling my friend Kate about, is to find so many people so eager to hear what you have to say. They're not just the, the, the author now, they're the national ambassador now. And they want to know what you have to say, because they understand that reading is important. And they are, they're looking for clues and hints. How can I get my child to read? How can I get my classroom to read? The most important moment in my two years, when I was in, uh, I was in a prison, and I went to lots of prisons uh, over the last two years. And this was sort of a loosely run prison. Um, and that there was some talking aloud among the, among the inmates. And one of the inmates, when the talking got a, a bit loud and I was speaking, one of the inmates made the others keep quiet. And he, what he said was, keep quiet, I want to hear this. Keep quiet, I want to hear this. He wanted to hear what I had to say about reading. That touched me. Because I knew that this program was working. I knew that if he wanted to hear about reading, somewhere in his mind, the message was coming through loud and clear. Sometimes it doesn't go through. Sometimes it's frustrating as heck. Frustrating as hell, frustrating <laughs> as <laughs> But there are times when it comes through. And teachers and parents have come up to me and thanked me. And that's what it was all about. And Kate, you're going to have a ball doing this. <laughs> Thank you.
we're finally about to hear from Kate. Uh, you've heard a lot about her. Uh, you've heard Dr. Billington talk about her as one of our finest writers of, for young people. Uh, you've heard Robin talk about how she was chosen, which gives you a sense of uh, the, not only the effort, but the background and the thought that goes into the selection of each of our uh, national ambassadors. Uh, you've heard others talk a little bit about what she brings as a person to uh, the period that she, where she will be representing us. It hasn't been mentioned that the national ambassador has two things to do for certain. Part of it, one is to kick off Children's Book Week in New York. Another is to come and be part of the National Book Festival at the Library of Congress. Beyond that, as Walter has indicated, there are special interests that the ambassador has. There are special places to go, state centers for the book around the country. Uh, it's a, a wonderful procedure and tradition that has been worked out. Now, Kate is, I think, the first ambassador who has had her first book because of Winn-Dixie, not only a runaway bestseller, it went for, for which she received the Newbery Honor Award, but it was also made into a film. In, 19, in 2003, she received the prestigious Newbery Award medal itself for the best book for young people from the American Library Association. Uh, for uh, the tale of Despero, which also was made into a movie, so she got off to a very fast start. Uh, her own journey, which she has talked about a little bit, and I'm just going to capsulize, capsulize using Kate's own uh, look and talk about her own career, it's something of a dream came, coming true, and we're glad that we can also be part of that dream, Kate. Uh, after moving to Minnesota from Florida in her 20s, homesickness and a bitter winter helped inspire the book because of Win dixie and look what has happened. Her latest novel, uh, Flora and Ulysses, which has been received great acclaim and it has already a place on the New York Times bestseller list. I would now like to invite two people up, both Kate and Dr. James Billington for the um, actual presentation of the National Ambassador Medal, and then Kate gets to speak. But would you please, <laughs> would, Dr. Billington, would you please come up? Yeah. some magic words here. <laughs> we'll look for I don't you. have to bend we'll over. Look for you for magic words. How are y'all doing? I I wrote a speech um, and I uh, brought I actually bought these yesterday in this very building, reading glasses. Um, <clears throat> is everybody ready for the speech? Over here, are you ready? Okay. I grew up in Florida in a small town 30 miles west of Orlando called Claremont. We moved to Claremont from Philadelphia in 1969 when I was five years old. Florida in those pre-Disney World days was populated by several strange and wonderful amusement parks. There was Weeki Wachi, where you could witness live mermaids performing a choreographed and sequined underwater spectacle. There was Gatorland, which you entered in a Jonah in the belly of the whaleish way by walking through the gigantic toothy jaw of an alligator. There was Six Gun Territory, a theme park devoted to the Wild West where every day at noon there was a showdown between the good guys and the bad guys on a dusty main street. Weeki Wachi and Gatorland and Six Gun Territory took up permanent residence in my young brain. I loved them. They provided dazzle and drama and danger. It was Silver Springs, however, which made the largest impact on me. 
Silver Springs had no mermaids with sequin tails, no gigantic alligator jaws outfitted with large cement teeth, no shootouts at high noon. What Silver Springs had was monkeys swinging through the treetops. Also, Silver Springs had glass bottom boats. I loved the monkeys, of course, but what I could never quite get over was the mystery and magic of the glass bottom boats. I found it endlessly fascinating to look down at my feet and view a whole world that would normally have been hidden to me. On glass bottom boats, you could see secrets. You were privy to a whole world hiding below the surface. Brightly colored fish, slow moving turtles, and massive and otherworldly underwater plants. The glass bottom boat rides at Silver Springs went a long way toward convincing me that there's another world inside of this world if you only have a way to see a vehicle for looking. Once, when I was eight years old, I was at Silver Springs with my aunt and my mother and my brother. We were sitting in a glass bottom boat stuffed full of people and I was staring down at my feet when a gigantic silver fish went flashing by. I don't know what kind of fish he was, I only know that he was huge and magical looking. The woman who was sitting next to me, a total and complete stranger, grabbed hold of my arm. My goodness, she said, did you see that fish? My goodness, who could imagine? I looked up from my feet and stared at the woman's face. It was open, delighted. There was some kind of face powder clinging to her cheeks. She had on a rain bonnet, even though the sun was shining. You have to understand that I was the shyest child in the world. I was the kind of kid who wouldn't say boo to a goose. I was afraid of my own shadow. The cat perpetually had my tongue. You couldn't have paid me. Really, truly, there wasn't enough money in the world to talk to a stranger. Oh my goodness, said the rain bonneted woman. She pointed down at her feet. Have you ever in your life? She still held hold, had hold of my arm. I looked down and I saw a turtle. And then something miraculous happened. I spoke to this person I did not know. I said, there goes a turtle. <laughs> that is exactly right, said the woman. She squeezed my arm. That is a turtle. And then she said, four words that I will always remember. She said, oh my, this world. I had a strange and dreamy moment then where I saw everything, all of it, from above. There was, this was something that happened to me quite a few times as a kid, a stuttery second where I was almost out of my body. And that day, I was suddenly looking down at myself and at the woman beside me, at the boat full of people, and at the secret world below my feet, the world of silver fish and turtles revealed to me by the glass. I felt like I was a part of everything. I felt connected to all of it, but most particularly to the stranger who still had hold of my arm. Who was that you were talking to, said my mother later when we were climbing out of the boat. I don't know, I told her. She was just someone I was looking at things with. And my mother, who talked to everyone, who was afraid of no one, and who was forever baffled and frustrated by my shyness, said, well, good for you. She thought maybe that I was changing, but I wasn't changing, not then, not yet. It was only that the marvels of this world, its secrets, and the magic of looking at all of it with someone else had managed to insert a small wedge into my heart. I had opened up a tiny bit. I was a little bit more awake. But enough about amusement parks and glass bottom boats and strangers and rain bonnets and gigantic silver fish. I am here to talk to you about books. Let's start about by talking about a book entitled Island of the Blue Dolphins. In 1972, I was in second grade at Claremont Elementary. My teacher was Mrs. Boyette. Mrs. Boyette wore cat eye glasses with glinting rhinestones. She was old and a little bit short tempered. She had been teaching for a very long time. I loved Mrs. Boyette with the whole of myself. I loved her because mainly every day after lunch, Mrs. Boyette read aloud to us. And out of all the books that she read to us in the course of that year, the one I remember most vividly is Island of the Blue Dolphins by Scott O'Dell. I love the story, but the reason I remember the book so clearly is because of Tony Finchel. Tony Finchel sat in the desk across from mine. Tony Finchel liked to trip me. I've changed his name. <laughs> He tripped me a lot. 
He purposely stuck his foot out into the aisle and then laughed and pointed at me when I stumbled. Why this upset me so much, I cannot say. Why I didn't ask him to stop or why I didn't trip him or tell on him to Mrs. Boyette, I don't know. I can only say that in addition to being a preternaturally shy child, I was a preternaturally terrified child. I was afraid about, of just about everything and everyone. To me, Tony Fenchel was not a second grade boy. He was a six foot tall monster with claws and sharp teeth. One time with no advance warning, Tony leaned across the aisle and pinched me. Most of the time, however, he confined his malicious actions to tripping. So anyway, Mrs. Boyette was reading aloud from Island of the Blue Dolphins, and mostly I was lost in the story and the strange wonders it held to be left alone on an island to be entirely by yourself and somehow survive. I hadn't known such a thing was possible. Much like the glass bottom boat, the book had the feeling of a world hidden inside of the world I already knew. I was captivated, enthralled, but still, while I was a dreamy, story-oriented kid, I was also very much a terrified pragmatist, and the whole time Mrs. Boyette was reading, I was keeping an eye on Tony Finchel. There's a point in Island of the Blue Dolphins when the main character, a girl named Karana, tames a wild dog. This, to me, was the most thrilling thing imaginable, and I was literally on the edge of my seat as Mrs. Boyette read aloud to us. I was leaning forward, listening, and when I looked over at Tony Finchel, I saw that he was leaning forward too. His mouth was open, his eyes were lit up. I felt a small jolt go through me, a lightning bolt of recognition. Good grief, Tony Finchel was like me. He was on the edge of his seat too. He was enthralled too. He wasn't a monster. He was a kid, he was a kid who liked to hear a story. Just as I had floated above the glass bottom boat that time, I floated for a second above the second grade classroom at Claremont Elementary. I saw everything from above, the wood floors, Mrs. Boyette's glittering cat eye glasses, the book in her hands. I saw myself leaning forward. I saw Tony leaning forward too. And then Tony turned and looked at me. He saw me seeing him and he smiled at me and I smiled back. Oh my, this world. Mrs. Boyette kept reading. She turned one page and then another page. The clock on the wall ticked steadily. The wood floors sighed and creaked. Life went on. But again, something miraculous had happened. I had seen Tony Finchel and he had seen me. Did Tony trip me again after this moment? Well, yes, he did. <laughs> was I still afraid of him? Of course I was. But the thing was that I had seen him and I could not go back to unseeing him. He wasn't a monster anymore, he was a boy and I was connected to him in a different, better way. This happened because of a story. This happened because of a story read out loud, a story read together. So what I want to say to you today is this, stories are glass bottom boat rides. We sit together and look together at this world and at the worlds hidden inside of this world. And looking together, listening together, helps us to connect. We are able to see each other. We open up. We change. I never really know what I'm doing when I tell a story. I write, as my writing teacher, Jane Resch Thomas, often says, behind my own back. And so it has taken me a long time to realize that I'm working toward the same moment in every story that I tell. And that moment is this one. Everyone together in a room, everyone connected. Reading stories brings me into that room. Writing stories brings me into that room. And reading stories and writing stories has brought me here into this room today. And what I would like to do with this incredible honor, the honor of being here with you in this room, and the immense honor of being the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, is to work to bring more people into the room, to show that we are made of stories and that these stories connect us. In an interview in the Parish Review, the writer Jeanette Winterston says that when we read a story, we think, yes, that's what's happening to me, or this is how I feel. Then immediately one is taken off that horrible little rock of chaos where one is entirely alone and brought back into the community. 
when we read together, when a grandfather reads to a granddaughter, when a teacher reads to a classroom, when a parent reads to a child, when a sister reads to a brother, when everyone in a town reads the same book silently together, we are taken off the horrible rock of our aloneness. We are brought back inside. Together we see the world, together we see each other, we connect, and when we connect, we are changed. And that's the end of the speech. And I am so grateful for this honor, and I'm gonna try to make y'all proud. I think I've gotta take it. Wonderful job. I am told we have a couple of questions from the students. Is that right? Would, would you like to go first? Here, we have a microphone for you. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, um, firstly, Stuart Hobson would like to congratulate you on your becoming ambassador. And um, we wanted to ask if you're planning on writing any more books, because obviously anything that you write is like super popular. So. <laughs> I, I like that clipboard. Are you going to write my answer down on that clipboard? I mean, I admire it, and it, it also makes me nervous. Okay. So, yes, I fully intend to write more books, um, and uh, I'm going to be traveling a lot as the ambassador, but everywhere I go, I will see faces like y'all's, and that will make me want to write more stories. So the answer is yes, and also I hope so. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we have a second question. Um, also with the okay. Yeah. Um, we were wondering, were there any people that you've met that inspired the characters in any of your books? Um, do you have parents who are lawyers or, um, so, you know, like, are you talking about whether I've taken real people and putting them into books and now, no, right, okay, nice forgiving look from you. No, actually, I have to say I have yet to base a character on anybody that I've met, but at the same time, I, I do get inspiration from connecting with you guys as readers. So while no one person has ended up in a book other than me, I think I show up in my books all the time, again, unwittingly and uh, unintentionally. I think I bear a, a striking resemblance to a squirrel, and I didn't really know that until I finished the latest book. But n no real people have been used yet other than me, and I doubt my reality. Okay, <laughs> all right, am I done now, do you think? You yeah. are done. Let's give Sadie. <laughs> Thanks for being here, you guys. Thank you. Thank you again, Kate. We indeed are almost done. Two announcements. Um, one is that we have books for the for the students, uh, and they are on the they are signed books by Kate. One for each student, and they're to pick them up on their way out. So you adults, please hold back. And we did a count, and we want uh, the kids to remember we remember this day. Uh, secondly, uh, we invite everyone to visit directly below us uh, the Young Readers Center. And I just want uh, Karen to stand up for a second. Karen Jaffe is our director of the Young Readers Center, and Karen will lead the charge downstairs uh, you can and if you don't want to go down the narrow exciting narrow staircase uh, there you can go back down the elevator down one floor and come back to see the young readers center and i think it would be a fitting conclusion for what has been a wonderful morning one more round of applause for all of our participants <laughs> And I know we will all keep reading and keep posted on what's happened, and we'll see you here again in a couple of years. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.